Hey folks, Richard Ames here, coming to you today from coronavirus lockdown, where I've recently gotten a haircut from someone who doesn't do haircuts. So don't judge. What I'd like to talk to you about today is how number of CPU cores affects your ability to run virtual instruments within your digital audio workstation. Now, there are a number of good references out there on the web using DawBench and some other reference projects to look at which CPU is better and how many CPU cores relate to how many plugins can you use within a project. And that's all good information, but that's not what I'm looking at in this particular video. What I'd like to answer in this video is how many CPU cores are good enough to run a collection of pretty typical projects? And so what I've done is I've put together a collection of three projects that span a decent range of the types of things you'd run within a digital audio workstation, uh, particularly with regard to how you use virtual instruments. And then I've measured their performance in terms of how many dropouts do you get when you play them back. And I've measured that in terms of both the buffer size that you use during playback and then the number of CPU cores that are active. So what I've got at the end is an indication of, of from a practical standpoint, what number of cores do you really need in order to write and produce music using virtual instruments within a digital audio workstation? My setup is built around Cubase 10 Pro and a Fireface connected via USB. This is a Fireface 802. I do use multiprocessing within Cubase. I do not use ASIO Guard though because I've had some issues with that in the past, particularly with uh, Vienna Ensemble Pro. I do boost the audio priority. I have the Steinberg Audio Power Scheme activated. Basically what that does is it ensures that the processor speed is always running at its maximum of 4.4 gigahertz. And within the BIOS, that is set up to be constant across all the cores. So there aren't certain cores that are higher, certain cores that are lower. It's set up so they all run at that same speed. And then within the Fireface settings dialog, this is how I change the buffer size. So what I'm looking at within this video is from a maximum of 256 down to a minimum of 48 samples. And then the processor that I have in this machine is an i9-10940X. That's a 14-core processor with hyper-threading, so you can see all 28 cores available here. The way I create different numbers of cores is by going into the BIOS and disabling the cores I don't need. So I have a maximum of 14 available. If I want to test 10, I simply go into the BIOS and disable 4. A few more quick comments about the setup. First of all, I'm running Windows 10 completely stock, so there are no tweaks or modifications to the operating system. Second, I'm running one buffer for the Vienna Ensemble Pro connection. So for the project that uses two slave machines over Ethernet, there is additional latency there in the form of one additional buffer that goes out to each of the slave machines for the Ethernet connection. And then third, because the slave machines are present in the first reference project, they are certainly a bottleneck and could have a significant impact on the total system performance. So, so while I'm measuring effective number of CPU cores and buffer size, Certainly the main DAW has an effect there, but also the slaves for those projects have a significant impact as well. And we get around that in the second and third projects where there are no slave machines. So what I've put together, I think, is a collection of projects that will represent a broad spectrum of different types of scenarios for different use cases. Another important consideration regarding the setup described here is that it is on PC, it's not on Mac, it is within Cubase, it's not within Ableton or some other DAW. It is using an RME Fireface 802. So the results that I present later in this video could be very specific to this setup, but I don't think so because I've seen the same basic trends on both Mac and PC. I've seen the same basic trends in both Cubase and Ableton. I run Ableton Live as well. Uh, and I've seen the same basic trends pretty much independent of type of audio interface. So it is a consideration. The results might be specific to what I've described here. So if you've got some indication that that's the case, I'd be curious to hear about it. So drop a comment in the notes below uh, and let me know. The first track I'm using for these tests is a typical hybrid orchestral track.
with a full string section. So there's violin one, violin two, viola, cello, double bass, some woodwinds, piccolo, a couple of flutes, clarinet, bass, clarinet, bassoon, a full brass section, trumpets, horns, trombones, tuba, uh, harp, piano, xylophone, standard orchestral percussion, snare drum, timpani, etc. And then some of the larger epic percussion you tend to hear in these types of tracks. Now, what you see right here are only the tracks that are used. This is within my standard orchestral template that has a total of 477 tracks, of which 347 are MIDI. Then there are a bunch of VST instrument tracks that are audio outputs. Uh, some effects channels for reverbs, and then the group tracks. This is what I use to make my stems, uh, are these group tracks right here. So there's also some synth and effects tracks up here at the top. I have three synth tracks and uh, a couple of sound effects uh, throughout the track. And then what I've also done for this test is for each of the sections, I've taken the lines. So for example, these string lines here, and I've duplicated them across multiple libraries, all playing at the same time to really uh, put a, a significant stress on the system. So for example, this string section here, the east-west strings, all of these lines are doubled in the VSL strings and the LA scoring strings and the Spitfire strings. The woodwind parts are duplicated in both east-west woodwinds and VSL woodwinds. And all of the brass parts are duplicated in east-west brass, cinebrass, and VSL brass. Now, most of the percussion is run locally here uh, on a local Vienna Ensemble Pro server. But most of the instruments are run on two slave machines. So all of the east-west libraries are run on this i7-6800K that's overclocked to 4 gigahertz and runs constant at that speed, so it does not downclock uh, when the CPU usage goes down. And then a bunch of the other libraries are run on this i9-7900X that is overclocked to 4.2 gigahertz. Now, both of these slave machines are connected to my master DAW via Vienna Ensemble Pro over a gigabit ethernet connection. The second track I'm using for these tests is more of a pop or EDM type of style. So there are seven synthesizer tracks in this project. There are six instances of Serum, one instance of Omnisphere. There's a MIDI track here running to contact with a piano in it. There's another MIDI track here with a drum sampler. And then there's a bunch of audio tracks. So there are a couple of live guitar tracks here that are ported into a group channel track. Um, there is a strings audio track that was bounced down. There is some percussion here uh, in an audio track. And then four vocal tracks and three effects tracks that are also audio. So the total uh, track count for this project comes out to 31. That includes another group channel track that I use to duck everything behind the kick drum. And if you look at the tracks, there's a pretty standard collection of plugins here. So compressors, delays, saturators, reverb. There's guitar amp simulator here. Um, what's maybe a little different is on the output bus, I've got this Ozone uh, mastering plugin here that includes a maximizer, dynamics, exciter, and equalizer. And uh, if I bring up the ASIO meter here, you'll see when I turn this on, it gives a pretty good kick to the, uh, the real-time um, performance of the system. So that's good because it'll help us understand how the number of processor cores uh, affects the project where there is clearly a pretty significant real-time limitation. The third project I'm using for these tests is exactly the same as the first, with the exception that all of the instruments are running on the same computer. I'm still using the exact same number of duplicate libraries across the string lines, the woodwind lines, and the brass lines. The difference is they're now all streaming from one computer, and they're all connected via one instance of Vienna Ensemble Pro that is running on the same machine as the DAW. The way I counted the number of audio dropouts was I loaded up the real-time performance meter in Cubase 
along with a handy little mouse click counter app. And what happens is every time you get an audio dropout, even if you can't hear it, the indicator turns red in the ASIO meter. So that tells you that the DAW couldn't keep up with the audio stream that's going out to the sound card and to your speakers. And so it turns red, and what you can do is you can click on it so it clears it out and goes back to its normal state. And then the next time a dropout occurs, it turns red again. So what happens is you play through the track and you click on that indicator to clear it out each time and the mouse click counter keeps track of how many times you've done that. So I do that three times through the track and at the end I have an indication of the total number of dropouts after those three times through the track and I can calculate an average number of dropouts per minute of playback. Here are the measurements for the hybrid orchestral project in the master and slave configuration. And let me take a second to explain what you're looking at on these plots. So along the horizontal axis here are the buffer sizes that I tested, 48, 64, 96, 128, and 256. And for each of those buffer sizes, there are six vertical bars here. And those vertical bars represent the average number of dropouts per minute for the different number of cores that I tested. So four, six, eight, 10, 12, and 14. And what I did on these plots is I capped them at 30 dropouts per minute because if you're getting more than 30 dropouts per minute, you're not gonna run the project at that buffer size anyway. It's, it's an unworkable number of dropouts. In fact, even two or three dropouts a minute, depending on how severe they are, can be unworkable as well. So I capped the plot at 30. The truth is for the 48 buffer size, there were many hundreds of dropouts per minute. Um, but whether it's 30 or 200 doesn't make a difference. You're not going to run the project at that buffer size. For 64, they, they did come down uh, into the range of around 10 to maybe 20. And there was definitely a dependence on number of cores. So as the number of cores increased, uh, in general, the number of dropouts did decrease. However, the dropouts were still severe enough that you're still not going to run the project at the 64 buffer size. So the difference between four cores and 12 cores or 14 cores actually doesn't matter because even at 12 or 14 cores, it's still not good enough to make it a workable project. By the time you got to a 96 buffer size, however, the number of dropouts did drop down to a manageable level. They're still obvious. They're still a little bit uh, difficult to work with, but in a pinch, you could certainly make it work. And then at the 128 and 256 buffer sizes, absolutely no issues working with uh, those two buffer sizes, even all the way down to four cores. So once you got up to a buffer size of 128 or 256, whether you were running four cores or 14 cores didn't make any difference the project ran just fine regardless of that core count. For the POP EDM track, the results look uh, significantly different. So at both the 48 and 64 buffer sizes, the number of dropouts per minute were so large that you wouldn't run the project at that setting. By the time you got to 96, it, the situation did improve a little bit. And in fact, uh, at the four, six or eight core count, uh, the project was pretty much unusable, but you could kind of get by with it at 12 or 14, still certainly less than ideal. Um, but again, in a pinch, you could probably make it work at those higher core counts at the 96 buffer size. But at the 128 or 256 buffer size, again, no issues whatsoever, whether you're running four cores or 14 cores. The hybrid orchestral track run from a single machine is definitely the most stressing of the three projects tested here, and that's reflected in these measurements. At 4864 or 96 buffer size, the number of dropouts totals in the many hundreds per minute, and you'd never run the project at any of those buffer sizes regardless of number of cores. So four cores versus 14 cores didn't make any difference. Now, when you got to 128, things got interesting because there was some indication of a practical advantage to higher core counts. At the four and six core measurements, you see many hundreds of dropouts per minute. But by the time you got to eight, there was a significant decrease. So you came out of the range of absolutely unusable and into the range where, okay, maybe things are starting to be workable. And then the advantage from eight to 10 is a little bit, but from 10 to 12 to 14, there's essentially no difference. And even from eight to 10, the difference is measurable, 
but from a practical standpoint, you're still getting a decent number of dropouts. You'd still notice them. There's some chance it could impact your workflow. So the reality is that you'd just bump the buffer size up to 256 anyway, at which point there's really no advantage to anything more than six cores. Okay, so those are all the measurements, and they're important because they help you to quantify what's better. But as I said at the beginning of this video, what I'm really interested in determining is what is good enough. And the way I'm making that determination is by evaluating what I can actually perceive. So while the ASIO indicator might show a missed buffer transfer, quite often that miss is so small that you can't hear it. And that's what the information on this chart reflects. So I've categorized each of the tests in terms of whether or not the dropouts were perceptible and more, more to the point, perceptible enough to be a hindrance to your workflow. So for example, for the hybrid orchestral with a master plus slave setup at 48 and 64 buffer sizes, absolutely the dropouts were perceptible. They were constant. They were a major hindrance uh, to getting anything done. So you would never run at those buffer sizes. Contrary to that, at 128 and 256 buffer sizes, the dropouts definitely were not perceptible. So yes, they occurred maybe once a minute, once every two minutes, but they were not significant enough to have any kind of impact on my workflow. Now, the story changed a bit at the 96 buffer size, where there definitely were some perceptible dropouts, but in general, they weren't significant enough to alter my workflow. So you could keep working through it, it certainly wasn't ideal. Uh, they might get a little annoying after a while, but if you're under a deadline, you're in a pinch, you got to get something done, you could certainly make it work. So that's what's indicated by the sum label in these tables here. For the pop EDM track, the story is very much the same, where at 96 buffer, uh, there were some perceptible dropouts that might cause a hindrance to your workflow. Uh, 128 and 256, both perfectly fine, no issues and 64 and 48, absolutely no way you'd run that project at either of those buffer sizes. And then for the hybrid orchestral setup uh, on a single machine, the results were different there because the, the unworkable range extended all the way into the 96 buffer size and part of the 128 buffer size. And again, this is where we did see that some practical advantage exists for number of cores. As you move from six cores to eight cores at the 128 buffer size on this project, you went from absolutely unworkable to, yes, maybe I could make it work. But again, the truth is you'd probably just bump the buffer size up to 256, at which point the distinction between four cores and 14 cores disappears. And that I think is the key takeaway from these tests. It's pretty hard for me to say there's a practical difference between six or eight cores and 14 cores. Yes, I did see a bit of a practical advantage going from six cores to eight cores when I tried to run all of that massive project from one machine. But again, you could just bump the buffer size up to 256, which is still a perfectly workable buffer size. And the latency associated with a buffer of 256 is still much lower than the latencies you get with acoustic instruments that people have been playing for millennia. So again, from a practical standpoint, I think six or eight cores is about all you need to run a collection of virtual instruments within a digital audio workstation. Hopefully you've gotten some useful information out of this video. I've wanted to do this kind of test for a while now because as I've gone through the last several cycles of CPU upgrades, going from four cores to six cores to 10 cores to 14 cores, I really haven't seen much of a difference in terms of my overall workflow. I still run at the same basic minimum latency. I still experience the same basic number of dropouts for a given project type. So I really wasn't seeing any difference as I increased my core count. And I think those results are borne out within the tests that I've shown here in this video. So again, I'll throw in the caveat that perhaps it is specific to Windows. I'd be curious to know if anyone else has a different experience on Mac. Perhaps it is specific to Cubase. Maybe if you run an Ableton or some other DAW, the number of cores is more of a factor. But certainly from my perspective, for the types of projects that I've shown within this video, and for the setup that I'm running, I really haven't seen much of an advantage for number of cores. So if you're shopping for a new CPU for a digital audio workstation, make sure you keep that in mind.